everyone's refreshed after coffee, there's still people filtering in. Um, I'm going to talk about um, one of the pilot studies that was undertaken predominantly through the Yorkshire Dales National Park Authority, but it was in partnership with, I was delivered by, largely by myself, I'm an independent um, contractor who works with the National Park Authority. Um, I've realised right off after looking at the, some of the presentations this morning, I haven't got a map. Um, with this sort of blissful arrogance of someone who grew up in God's own county, I assume everyone knows where the Yorkshire Dales are. Um, there's some. <laughs> there's always going to be a little cover, isn't there? At least it wasn't Lancastrian saying something. But, um, yeah, so you're just going to have to take my word for it. And some of these fabulous pictures that this is the, clearly the most beautiful landscape anywhere within the United Kingdom. Um, I was told to sell it a little bit, and if anyone is planning summer holidays at the moment, I would <laughs> strongly recommend. Um, myself, as Solstice Heritage, the National Park Authority, Historic England, got the correct logo. Um, you can tell that I was doing putting this presentation together last night because then I got the right logo rather than people have prepared several months in advance. <laughs> um, but I should also say we had a big uh, consultancy input through the course of the project from broadly the Yorkshire Algeo group and there was some really uh, useful input from particularly from people, uh, local authority archaeologists who represent other national parks within the north who deal with similar issues. Um, our pilot looked at national importance on the landscape scale. It specifically targeted a theme um, that was uh, set up during the, the call for uh, call proposals, looking at um, non-designated um, nationally important heritage assets on a landscape scale comprising several hundred monuments, as an example. Um, there are terminological problems which, thankfully, some of the talks this morning actually have already dealt with very well. Um, we have to, at the start of the project, we had to grapple with what's nationally important. Well, we have broadly covered that. There are mechanisms currently in place for deciding at a very coarse scale what constitutes a nationally important site. We had to talk about what is not designated. When we're dealing with landscapes, it's a, quite a big, a big difference to dealing with a single site where we say why isn't that site designated does it not meet certain criteria we're looking at sites which are coherent sites but may include three or four scheduled monuments within what we'd consider the boundary of the landscape site so these are slightly larger issues we have to grapple with right at the start and then I've just touched on it what do we mean by landscape scale um, we we didn't want to talk about archaeological landscapes by turning it around because we felt from the outset that archaeological landscapes and the uh, things that landscape archaeology deals with as a discipline, as a subdiscipline or as a discipline in its own right, um, have great, quite often have great big blank areas that offer much to the appreciation of that overall landscape. Mm -hmm. We're trying to talk about lands sites on a landscape scale that are probably coherent, contiguous, that can have a boundary defined around them, whereby everything within that may or may not meet the criteria of national importance. Um, at this point, this was probably only about a week into the project, and we realised that this was a much bigger issue than we'd initially thought when we when we put the proposal together. It was going to touch on um, uh, issues and things that are relevant to much wider parts of the discipline. Um, so this now 15 minutes talk after I've rambled on is going to be quite a swift gallop through some of the things we thought were important, some of the possible solutions that we feel might be good, might be useful in the future. Um, I say it's it was we realized it was quite a quite a vast and complex topic. Um, we set out the way to bring order to this chaos we decided was to imagine an idealized way if you were from the point of saying oh we've got this landscape scale site that might or might not be nationally important right the way through to ultimately how are we conserving how we're we managing that site we imagine this idealized what we call an idealized workflow this is a bit of a clumsy term to be honest um, with four basic stages with which we can use to talk about the different issues. There's the process of identification. How are these sites identified? Who identifies them? 
um, how do they come to the recognition of whichever curatorial body is dealing with them? How do we characterise them? What criteria, what methods do we use to describe the national importance of these sites? Um, how do we delimit them? How do we draw a boundary around a landscape scale heritage site? Um, well, do we even draw a boundary around it? And how do we manage them, ultimately? How do we manage the data about them? And how do we physically manage them on the ground when we're interacting with what may be hundreds of different landowners in extreme cases? OK, so identification, the identification process then. A couple of the key topics. We felt that identification of these sites, and this holds true to many sites, not just on a landscape scale, there's a difference between a reactive identification of them and a proactive identification of them. I'd say with smaller sites, individual sites, reactive identification is often quite important. Threat-led being <laughs> perhaps through, the man through planning being one of the most obvious. When we're dealing with landscapes, we felt this was probably not a route that was actually going to often bring these sites to our attention. Um, there are a couple of, couple of situations where this might happen. Uh, landscape scale survey within the National Park and within other um, broadly rural areas, certainly in the north, we, there's a lot of broad, low, wide scale landscape survey going on. I do quite a lot of work with the Wildlife Trust <laughs> doing moorland survey in advance of peat restoration. And so when you are looking at these landscapes that might not have perhaps been examined in detail before, there is a potential for you to suddenly find the remains that create a much larger site or fill in the gaps between known, known sites in the past. So there is a potential there. Um, and probably the NMP, the National Mapping Programme, being the main thing, revealing new sites on a very, very big scale. There's a potential there where you suddenly find a landscape scale site that you didn't know about before. Having said that, we felt that the most likely way you're going to actually be able to identify these sites in order to bring them into some kind of coherent management um, is through a proactive process, actually going out, looking for, characterising and mapping these areas. Um, this could be through mass characterization of individual monuments. We looked, we did a lot, and I will touch on this a few times, did a lot of looking back at the documentation of the old Monuments Protection Programme. Um, there were some really useful things in there, and it was actually taken quite a long way down the road in Yorkshire Dale, so it, 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 there was a really, really good baseline of information for us from that. Um, or there are approaches, proactive approaches, which seek to delimit landscape scale sites as their core objective. And another uh, big thing, we, a uh, big program that we found useful as comparison with the premier principal archaeological landscapes down in the southwest in Dartmoor, Exmoor and uh, Bob Minmoor. Um, now this, I, I don't know whether any of the talks today, no, I don't think any this morning did, um, we examined whether this sort of approach, characterising sites at a landscape scale, can be done in some kind of semi-automated way, using the data within that are within existing data sets, HERs predominantly, um, and trying to almost write protocols whereby, in a G through GIS analysis, you can say, well, these sites are of equal importance and are close enough together that you can draw a boundary. We felt that's not useful. Um, there are a number of reasons why, which we expand on quite a lot in the project report, but predominantly in order to have an underlying data set from which you can abstract meaningful data, that underlying data set has to go through such a colossal pre-processing and data cleaning exercise to get it to that stage that it's actually really not, it's just not practical. Um, certainly with the data sets we were working with, we felt that. Oops, wrong way. So once you've identified your sites, we then thought, how do we characterise them? How do we actually decide that they're of national importance? Um, it touches on quite a few things that were said earlier earlier today. Um, the most important characterisation um, is, to, is to say, is it nationally important and is to have, we felt that the non-statutory criteria already set out a good way um, of an initial discrimination. It's what would be the discrimination stage in the old Monuments Protection Programme. Um, there is limited use of objective scoring in that as well, which provides this level of objectivity, which may hold up to challenge when you're saying this entire 
what we call a landscape scale site is nationally important. Um, I've said their MPP expansion, the MPP took the statutory criteria and within their guidance expanded four of those criteria um, into sub-criteria and those we found were particularly useful when we're talking about on a landscape scale. So from that initial discrimination it's possible then to say a site is nationally important and can be designated. Um, I've said it, the example being Castle Bolton here. We looked at a large area around Castle Bolton and Wensleydale and there are already a few scheduled monuments within what we would term a coherent landscape scale site. Um, when we did the initial discrimination we looked against the, uh, the non-statutory criteria. It became evident that what we would actually recommend there is that a bunch more bits of that landscape scale site should really be scheduled in their own rights and the stuff in between was not could not be demonstrated to be of national importance therefore we're not saying that's a landscape scale site we're saying that that is a group of monuments which are related but can be perfectly adequately managed through the existing routes of scheduling um, we have sites that we looked at that we said well <clears throat> by really an objective measure. These are not nationally important by those non-statutory criteria. Therefore, we're not concerned with them at this point. That's not the focus of this project. But then, and this is really where the focus of the project came, you have those sites which are nationally important but are not designated for whatever reason. Um, now, we felt that in terms of a landscape scale site, quite often the reason for a site not to be designated was a perhaps more political reason than to do with any guarding the archaeology, or guarding the archaeological interest. It was the sheer problems, logistical problems, of trying to manage scheduling over a large area across several land holdings. Um, Tim talked about this just before the coffee break. Once we've used the non-statutory criteria, how do we characterise, how do we articulate the national importance or significance, how do we articulate it in a way that is meaningful to all the different strands that are going to end up having to go into managing these sites. Um, the conservation principles language of values, the MPPF language of significance, they are, they are close enough allied to, these, these three forms of language are close enough allied to each other that we felt you could have a single almost statement of significant statement of importance that could satisfactorily articulate using this language without <laughs> adding much additional, which would just complicate issues. However, um, and this came from the, the PALS in the Southwest, um, Premier Archaeological Landscape, not, not just our friends in the Southwest. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, there are some more broad characteristics. So, which can be in some ways covered by um, the existing language, but local distinctiveness, landscape aesthetic, <laughs> landscape amenity. When we're dealing with sites on a landscape scale, these actually, we realise, become very important. And local distinctiveness is actually, paradoxically in terms of the language, a, quite an important characteristic leading to national importance. Um, in the Yorkshire Dales, we have the um, barns and walls conservation area. The Yorkshire Dales field barns are a defining aspect of that landscape and that local distinctiveness makes it you broadly, well, unique in some terms. Oh, I keep pressing the wrong arrow. We've found our sites, we know they're there and we've characterised them as nationally important. Um, how do we draw a line around them? Um, this um, exercised us for a while as well. Um, this, the problem of drawing, of delimiting sites is fundamental to um, not just a landscape scale sites by any, by any stretch of the imagination. You have an inherent boundary problem, which we call the boundary problem, but may or may not be. The first aspect of which is that by drawing a line, you say, here stops the importance. Anything outside this is not. Now, that's actually a true statement in terms of um, uh, sort of the legislative cover we've got. We are saying that is where the national importance stops. Now, whether that's satisfactory in terms of archaeological remains is a slightly larger debate. Um, but when we're dealing with a landscape scale site, I think that problem is exacerbated. 
Um, the converse of that is um, that by having a line, you have a clarity of boundary, you have clarity of management. Again, what Tim was saying this morning, it's nice to have a polygon on a map saying simply here is importance. It's very useful in terms of all the other agencies uh, in, and interest groups that we would have to deal with. Um, internal homogeneity is part of the boundary problem. By drawing a single line around a landscape of national importance, we are neglecting to um, articulate where there may be clusters of particularly important monuments within that landscape, how that landscape was used, <coughs> um, a core of um, uh, well, the Castle Bolton landscape, the castle itself, surrounded by this fantastically well-preserved um, medieval field system, um, which is, we think, broad, most of it is actually of national importance yet they were used in completely different ways and a single boundary fails to draw that distinction. It, it homogenizes everything within that boundary. Um, we started to explore therefore the idea of possibly core and periphery approaches to it where you can define core monuments, core aspects of that landscape scale site and those which are perhaps still demonstrably of national importance or else they wouldn't be in the boundary but um, are of lesser significance to it. Um, the, one of the um, interesting things that was suggested by the um, talks within the National Park Authority was that a core periphery approach to this sort of landscape designation, if you, we are only locally designating these sites, if there is not a national approach to protect them, then there's a very simple dis uh, distinction can be made where you would actively manage the core monuments, you would prioritise funding, um, that's where you would focus your efforts, and the periphery of that landscape scale site would really become more of a um, an alert area. It would be somewhere where passive management would be. You would encourage agri-environment uptake to focus on heritage issues. Um, we undertook a sample exercise within the National Park to try and draw some lines around heritage, uh, uh, landscape scale <laughs> heritage assets and sites. Um, and it became very clear that the way to do it is you have to have good data. It will start with the HER. The HER has to be good. Um, it has to be well maintained. Um, and it's reliant on local knowledge. Um, we really felt strongly that this is something that it's, it's, if it's going to be carried out, it really needs to be under the management, at least, of the local authority because someone coming in, you have to know that landscape. You have to appreciate that landscape. Um, I'll quickly, I'm not too far off the end, good. Um, now, in terms of management, this actually um, underpins much of what I've already said. What are the levels of protection that can be applied to landscape scale sites? Um, scheduling. We could just schedule them. Massive, big sites. There is, There are present, there are big scheduled areas, there are big scheduled monuments in the country. Um, the exercise we undertook was showed us that this, that many of the sites you actually would schedule small component monuments within, but there were undoubtedly coherent, contiguous remains, which all of which would meet the criteria for national importance, and therefore, well, let's schedule them. It's, it's a, it'd be a very simplistic approach, but it has the benefit of having a recognised designation, strong statutory underpinning. Now, to possibly to navigate the logistical problems of scheduling a colossal area of a national park, um, we have also looked at the implementation of heritage partnership agreements, which are currently only um, uh, in relevance to built heritage, only legislated for. Um, a heritage partnership agreement put in place at the point of scheduling with one or more landowners depending on how large the area is, may go some way to um, ameliorate the, the logistical problems of implementing um, broad-scale scheduling, um, effectively perhaps like extending on a case-by-case -case basis, basis class consents to those areas for specific um, uh, activities. Um, we looked at areas of archaeological importance, kind of the, the, the forgotten cousin of the uh, sort of the area designation. Um, there's very few of them around the country at the moment, and they were 
um, introduced before PPG 16 and therefore there are some fairly fundamental problems with the implementation of them as the legislation stands. If there's an appetite for amending legislation and therefore providing landscape scale sites with statutory protection other than scheduling, then amending the areas of archaeological importance, um, uh, the uh, sort of the um, criteria and the way in which they are managed may well provide one route to that. Equally, archaeological conservation areas, um, again mentioned briefly by Tim, what we said was rather naively perhaps, well, why not just add archaeological interest into the into the act? Just add that in next to architectural, and um, with there's an existing model there for how you manage heritage in a broad area. It's not as onerous as um, the scheduling constraints. Perhaps that's something we could look at. Um, if there's not an appetite for having statutory protection for these, then the route is local designation. The route is a local designation implemented by local authorities, but to a broadly national um, standard, um, whereby these sites are recognised within local planning policy. They become priority areas for funding sources. Uh, they become priority areas for agri-environment uptake with relevance to heritage um, and they become effective large alert areas within uh, the local authorities planning system. Um, we dredged up an old white paper on landscape conservation orders which was um, toyed with in the 1980s which would give the national parks emergency powers to designate these areas and afford them extra protection. Now I think that's probably long gone but it was something we found quite interesting that was even ever toyed with um, I've mentioned priority areas for countryside stewardship as it will become. Um, the, um, obviously we, we've said already we're clashing this session with the archaeology on the farm unfortunately because I think there's some quite neat tie-ups. Um, but that is one of the prime objectives of the premier principal archaeological landscapes in the southwest is that these are priority areas for stewardship and I think that is probably a very strong route to affording extra protection to these landscape scale sites. And then there is just the um, explicit, really, protection offered. Once we say this is nationally important, even if nothing else, we've drawn a line around something, we've said we've gone through this, we've documented our methodology, it is afforded the extra protections under planning that are within MPPF and its sort of offshoot guidance. So even if nothing else is done, just by going through this action, we afford it the extra protection by it being there and on the map. Um, uh, very, very briefly, uh, I won't read through all these because I mentioned them quite a lot, but the monuments, the value of the Monument <laughs> Protection Programme is a discontinued an old project that characterised many, many um, <laughs> archaeological sites. Um, that we found hugely useful. There's a massive bank of data there that can be brought forward to look particularly at landscape sites as well because there was uh, also theoretical underpinning for what they called relict cultural landscapes and the approaches to that. And then the uh, premier principal archaeological landscapes as a landscape designation that where there is a documented methodology for identifying and managing these uh, through a local designation. Um, I think I've actually covered these. I did have this nice conclusion screen <laughs> up, but I've managed to talk about them all the way through. So um, what I'll do, because I've been given the stop sign, <laughs> I'll leave it there um, and say, well, thank you very much for listening. Thank you.